I'm happy to record this, but I'm not doing the opening again. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, here we go. Um, I'd like to share with you uh, some a brief overview of our school, um, and then we'll move on within that. So ISD is actually in its 38th year of existence. It started by a group of parents in 1983. Um, moved to it was uh, formally recognized by the Senegalese government in 1987 as part of a diplomatic agreement between the U.S. Embassy and uh, the Ministry of Education and Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in Senegal. Um, for many years, it was a relatively small American style school. Uh, in the early 2000s, as our community started to change, so did the school and the desire um, for it to become more international, which it is very much so today. Uh, as of Friday, we had 720 students. Uh, believe it or not, that's just only eight students off our, our historic peak from last year. We draw children from North America, Europe, 40% uh, from North America, 30% from Europe, 20% from across Africa, and 10% from the Middle East and Asia. That's a little bit misleading because that's by primary passport. And many of our students, of course, have two, three, or even four passports. We, this year, we have about 60 different nationalities amongst our, our student group with every continent represented except Antarctica. Um, and 40% of our children, are, uh, our students are children of color. Our school in the, has seen significant enrollment growth pre-COVID in the past couple of years, and we're basically getting fairly close to capacity at this point. I'm proud to announce today that yesterday, we just found out that we are now an authorized middle years program school with the IB. So we've achieved our strategic goal of being a three program IB school. We offer PYP, we've are been fully authorized for two years, MYP, right, uh, just recently, and we've been an IB diploma school for four years. Uh, we're proud of the fact that last year, over 90% of our eligible grade 12 students participated in the IB diploma, and over 90% of the students passed. Uh, in addition to that, the secondary school is looking at providing alternate pathways uh, to other students for which the IB diploma may not be their choice or, or the best fit. Um, I'm going to stop there and give the rest of my time to Lauren, our secondary principal, because I know he has, he has quite a bit to show you. Alan, thank you very much. Um, welcome, everybody. My name is Lauren Bird. I'm the secondary school principal, and I'm very fortunate to have been here now for four years. And one of the things that I'm, I'm most proud of is the fact that my daughter is here and she's done incredibly well by, um, by her time in our school. At the end of the day, the most important thing we have as a school is our students, and we wanna make sure that we do incredibly well by them. And as a parent, I, I can definitely say that my daughter's done incredibly well by our school. I'll share my screen. Um, I'll take you through a few slides. Um, it's more a chance to, to point out a few key parts of information, or key pieces of information, sorry. At the heart of an excellent school is definitely the people. And at the heart of the, the people who are most concentrated on is your son, your daughter, it's our students. And beyond that though, it's really important that as part of our community, uh, you as parents are woven in, in integrally, the faculty as well, and the broader community in Dakar. And one of, the th one of the things that I enjoy most about my time here is that students, parents, faculty alike while they're here, they continually speak to the best part of ISD being our community. And at the heart of that, it's strong, positive, healthy relationships. And we believe that that's actually the foundation for learning as well. We need your son or your daughter in class, feeling well-connected, socially, emotionally grounded, so that they can learn. And that's been a strategic goal for the school over the past seven years. And we've done incredibly well bringing that to life. And it's one of the reasons why we have such strong academic success is because we have strong positive connections. And to that end, today we'll go through things quickly. Please know that if, if there's anything you're wanting to know, uh, please contact us and we can set up individual Zoom times. Or if you're in the city, we can find ways for you to come in. Um, Jen Laria is on the call, she's our MYP coordinator. And for example, if you're wanting to learn more about the MYP program, she'd be happy to meet with you. And again, it's the idea that at the heart of an excellent school, it is people and relationships. And so we were wanting to invite you in for that. 
Many of you will have seen this on the, on the website. Hopefully you have. We have core values as a school. At the heart of it is diversity. It's incredibly important for us to recognize and appreciate the diverse community members who we have. We want them included. We want them respected. And diversity comes from, from race, from ethnicity, in terms of academic ability, in terms of artistic ability. We're wanting to see students and parents and faculty members as individuals and appreciate them each as best that we can. Beyond that, the idea of creativity, open-mindedness, responsibility, and excellence are at the heart of what we're doing. And one of the things that we think is incredibly important to share with you is that we want your son, your daughter, our students to have a well-rounded, rigorous program. And that means that we value the arts and the athletics as well as academics. It's not just what happens in class from 8.30 to 3.30 during the day. We, we actively expect students to be well involved above and beyond as well, because that learning is beneficial in and of itself. It also helps form and solidify relationships, which then translate to better learning in the class. As Dr. Knobloch mentioned, we're now a continuum school, which means we have the middle years program and the diploma program across grades six to 12. And the, the best way that I can put it is, if we could find a better curriculum, we'd provide it. And we believe that the best international curriculum steps, whether they're transitioning back home before they graduate, or whether they're heading into university. Our students are graduating this year, going off to top universities around the world and to the best fit university for them. There is a, a direct moral component in the IB that fits well with what we're wanting. We're wanting to create the best possible person in your son or daughter. We're wanting them to be leaders. We're wanting them to take active, engaging stances in terms of helping their local communities, for example. There's more to it than just learning what happens in books. And importantly, we're also wanting to teach your son, your daughter, the why of what we're doing, to give them purpose in terms of what they're doing. The, some of you may have seen this already in terms of looking at the MYP and the DP. One thing to point out is that at the heart of everything is the student. And so the diagram is purposeful in, put, in terms of putting students at the center of learning. And that's what we as a school do as well. And so our, our foremost concern is always what's best for students. That's what we expect of teachers to do in classes. As administrators, our job is to do what's best for teachers so they in turn can do what's best for students. The other thing that I think is significant in terms of the diagram here is that the subject areas around the outside are all each equally valued. We definitely value language acquisition, math, science, the more traditional subjects, but we also have things like the arts and physical education and design included, and they are included and valued equally. And so we're truly wanting a well-rounded curriculum in terms of our core values, and the IB philosophy fits well with that. The one other message that we wanted to share is that service learning is at the heart of what we're doing. We want your son, your daughter, we want our students to learn key knowledge, key skills, key dispositions, and we want them to do something with it. We want them to actively make a difference in their, their respective communities. It could be a community within our school, and as well, like hopefully as a community beyond as well. And we've had excellent success in terms of bringing that to life over the past several, several years as we're growing into becoming a, a full IB school. We have some room to improve, but fundamentally we're all involved in finding ways to make sure that we're helping and making a difference in our, our respective worlds. The other idea is that communication with you as parents is of paramount importance. We have lots of different avenues in terms of keeping in touch with you. Uh, we'll have monthly meetings where we share key elements of our teaching and learning. Counselors will have regular meetings. There are the parent-teacher conferences, uh, report cards. Manage back is a system where you as parents can keep um, in tune in terms of what your son or daughter is doing in class. The JAG journal, the parent's student handbook. There are lots of different ways we're trying to keep you well informed because you are integral members of your, your son or daughter's learning process. And then the other idea again is to go back to that point. When you have questions, we really want you to reach out. The idea is we're a, a school like any other, but the more that you're in tune with what's going on, the better we can preempt having a problem. And so we, we actively invite you to be in regular contact with your teachers, with me as principal, with Dr. With Dr. Knobloch as director. If you reach out, we'll find the right person to get you in, in contact with. 
Uh, last message is we're incredibly fortunate to have you joining our community. Each of you will bring something to make our, our community a better place and we're looking forward to meeting you in person. Thank you, Lauren. Um, Susan, do you want to introduce the video we're going to show here in a minute? No? All right. <laughs> Let me show you. We have a, a video for you talking about um, the IV diploma program at ISD. Uh, it'll be about four minutes. I will post the link in the chat uh, box in case for some reason um, the internet doesn't support you watching the video. So I will share my screen. So the IB Diploma Programme is the third of the three international baccalaureate programmes that we offer at ISD. It takes place in the last two years of high school and is a highly prestigious qualification that students can take on. I believe the Diploma Programme is first and foremost about um, fostering critical thinking skills in students so that they can apply what they've learned to solve global issues. It's also about fostering independent learning in students and creating lifelong learners. Teaching in the DP means that as a teacher that you have to accept to let go. You have to accept that your students are going to take ownership of their learning, that it's student-led, and that you as a teacher are here to assist and to guide them. I do think that an IB classroom is different than a traditional classroom in the sense that we are on a much more equal level to our teachers because we're both participating uh, in the creation of knowledge. You get to apply the skills you learn in IB and apply it to real life. And it's really cool to see where your knowledge takes you. There's all sorts of things that set the diploma apart ranging from its internationalist view, ranging from its underpinning statements that relate to trying to make the world a better place and encouraging tolerance, encouraging intercultural awareness and cultural competence. You discover a lot of different cultures and different uh, ways of learning and you start to understand and appreciate different things. It's not about memorization and regurgitation of facts. It's all about deriving formulas on your own. It's about um, modeling certain real life phenomena using mathematical techniques. The thing with IB is that it lets you choose the subjects you want to choose. So I chose all of my subjects that I really liked. So basically, like I, all my, I like all of my subjects. Yeah. Any class you pick in IB is interesting. Like I picked chemistry and I thought I would hate it. Uh, and it turns out it's one of my favorite classes. The, the way teaching and learning takes place, it's a more organic process than the traditional lecture driven teacher talk and chalk idea. And students are learning in groups, they're learning in pairs, they're feeding back to each other. I the diploma program is a rigorous program that uh, requires you to work a lot and think critically and it helps apply what you learn in the diploma program in like in real life situations. It teaches you how to be more open-minded and to like look look at the world with a different perspective. It challenges teachers to become lifelong learners as well. We're constantly seeking to better ourselves in everything that we do. All right. So at this stage of the process, um, how we did it this morning that seemed to work really well is we invite, we would like to give you significant time to ask whatever questions you want, uh, students or parents. Um, it seemed to work fairly well for folks to put their questions in the chat. Um, I'll moderate and I'll answer some and I'll pass on some to Lauren, um, as well as perhaps some of the other staff who might be on the call. So with that, Take a moment of your time and start uh, putting in your questions in the chat.
if you don't come up with any questions, then I'm just going to have to start singing or something. And if you've ever heard me sing, you don't want to see that happen. We just need that first question to get us going. Dress code. Lauren, you want that one or you want me to take that one? Happy to jump in. Um, the, the, dress code, the dress code has gone through a, a few versions over the, the past several years. And we've actually got the, the Student Leadership Council, both the middle school and the high school, working on a new dress code and refining it this year. Uh, fundamentally, what we do is, is ask students to dress culturally appropriately, um, appropriately for the, the activities that they're engaging in. And we ask them to make good decisions in terms of who they are and what they're wanting to, to portray. Our, our dress code is fairly, fairly wide open in terms of what students can wear. And certain things like we're not wanting any disrespectful language, we're not wanting anything that promotes um, certain activities that we, we wouldn't value as a community. Um, and so it's more of a, a broader guideline to help students make good decisions. Uh, in terms of in terms of French, in terms of each of the classes, uh, we have a block schedule, and so on one day in secondary, students will see, see four of their teachers, and then the next day they'll see the other four teachers, and each class is 75 minutes. And so in one week you'll see a class a teacher three times, and the next week you'll see them twice. So you'll have a class every other day, and each of each of the classes is 75 minutes in length. The second part of the question, the, um, what is the content for native French speakers? Um, so we do offer multi-ability levels, uh, language A or native speakers, um, as well as those who are learning the language or somewhere in the middle. Uh, the content for the native French speakers is, is very similar to what you might see in an international curriculum. We use a variety of authors. Uh, the idea is to maintain the levels of the student uh, with the IB diploma in terms of what they would say is a language A or a primary language um, around that. Uh, if you want something more specific, Susan can put you in touch with uh, the head of our French department. Um, I have a question here that was sent directly to me. Um, if your placement test gives you seventh grade and you're 10 years old, would that matter? I love that question. Um, when we're determining placement, what we look at in the secondary school is we look at where you've come from. So the idea is that if you're 10 and you've graduated sixth grade, we can think about seventh grade. I would tell you that um, we also pay attention to age appropriateness, meaning that particularly within our secondary school, the students are growing and developing in so many different ways. We wanna make sure that you're also, the, any student that would be placed age appropriately. Um, so the, the biggest, factor that we look at in placing in secondary school is where you've been from, you know, have you completed sixth grade, have you completed seventh grade or what have you, and then, or in the high school age, how are you accumulating the credits for the grade that you're applying to? Um, there have been some cases where we've had students who have been promoted above their age coming from other schools. And then when we test them, we realize that they're better suited for, suited for a younger grade. One of the things that really impacts us here um, is we bring in children from all around the world. And many of you have traveled, you know that schools are not the same. What you teach kids at certain grade levels don't remain the same. Um, and so our placement system is trying to balance all those things out. Um, I can tell you that the students who, uh, if, if you have a student who say has uh, in sixth grade, but they can do seventh, eighth grade math, our teachers are good at challenging those children and extending those children. And we're always willing to look at, at what we can do individually for those students. Uh, transport system. Um, parents are responsible for transporting their, their children to and from school. Uh, periodically, the school looks at utilizing a bus service. Um, in the past, uh, there hasn't been enough demand of that to actually make it, make it financially viable for our families. Um, mentioned the importance of art. Could you say a bit more about our program? Do you offer music classes? Lauren, do you want to take that one, please? Yeah, um, the progress in the arts has been part of our strategic plan as well over the past seven years. It's led to the, the new theater that's just been completed. Uh, we've had our, our first performances there as well. And so we very much value it. Um, within the middle years program, grades six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, all students each year one of their eight classes is an art class, and we value that in terms of time equally with each of the other classes. 
And so we offer a good deal of choice as well, from film to theater arts, to visual arts, um, to actually di digital photography as well, even down in the middle school. And then in the diploma program, uh, for a school our size, we offer a, a wide range of arts as well. And we actually highly encourage students and actively encourage students to take art as their sixth DP course. And there we have the visual arts, we have film, and then we also have the theater arts in the diploma program. Uh, we have music classes. We have a, a, a MYP music, grade six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. In the diploma program, we don't offer music. Uh, and then after school, we have a variety of after school activities, a concert band, a performance band, lots of opportunities outside in terms of the co-curricular offerings to get involved with music as well. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I was trying, I was waiting, we have our first COVID question. I was kind of betting amongst myself on how long that would take. Um, so let me tell you our COVID story for those who aren't familiar. Um, on Friday, we celebrated our 140th day with students on campus this year. Uh, we've had students on campus from the first day all the way through. Uh, since November, we've had every student's invited to come to campus five days a week. Um, we have some, uh, our COVID protocols uh, are based on two main pillars that have kept us safe. Number one is we do require masks um, for all people who are, are, are on campus. And number two, if any member of the household has a COVID symptom, every member of the household has to stay home until the household is symptom free for 24 hours. Well, we've certainly had cases in our community. Um, we... We've not, we've not had a definite transmission on campus. Uh, we've had sporadic times where we've had to um, ask a cohort to stay home. Our secondary school, except for 11 and 12, has been in cohorts. Um, and that's one of the ways that we, we've limited the risk of having students uh, have to be home. Um, and so we're really, we're really proud of the fact that we've had students on campus throughout the whole year. Um, I think we're one of the few schools in the world that have been able to say that. Looking forward to next year, um, we are optimistic we can continue to open up and become more um, closer to what, we, what school looked like in 2019. Um, there'll be three determining factors for us to understand what our health and safety regulations will be. Number one is whatever the government of Senegal issues. Obviously we are a host, we are guests in this country and if our host country issues a mask order or something affecting sports or what have you, we will abide by it. Number two is what are recommendations are we seeing from the health and safety, I'm sorry, the international health organizations around health and safety. And the third factor will be the degree to which our faculty, staff, parents, and even our older students are vaccinated. Um, our school has an expert panel of medical professionals and public health professionals who advise our school nurse and school administration on our health and safety protocols. I'm really proud of the fact a recent parent survey showed that 90% 90 90 of our parents had a favorable opinion of how we oversaw COVID and the 10% who did not felt we were a bit too restrictive. And to be honest, I'll take that. I'll take that criticism um, because it's allowed us to stay open. Um, we've started to reintroduce uh, after school activities in a limited fashion. Uh, we enjoyed our first ever play in our brand new theater. Um, that was an interesting uh, with a live audience that was interesting with COVID restrictions. And so we, we presume at a worst case scenario, we're gonna be where we are today. Uh, that students will be coming every day, we'll have a limited after school activities. Um, and our hope is as this evolves and the science evolves that we'll be able to open up even further. Uh, I have more, I'm happy to give you more specific answers or information if you need to. But let's get back to the questions. Lauren, this one's for you. Could you tell us more about design and technology components of the curriculum and the facilities which exist to support that learning? Yeah, this is a question we're, we're very excited about. Um, one of the reasons we became an MYP school is to bring design into our curriculum. And so we've done that over the past two years. And the other exciting part is that we've got a new innovation center. It uh, was brought to life a little over a year ago. And it's um, a two-story building with potential to actually grow on top of that. And we have a maker space on the bottom floor, uh, open concept second floor, so that students, parents, community members can actually come in and be part of that as well. And so we've, we've got a, a growing um, design program, which we're very excited about. The one thing, because of COVID, we weren't able to 
to occupy the innovation center this year. We've had to use it for other classrooms because of the cohort model that we have in place. And looking to this coming August, we'll be able to, to change and actually launch the innovation center. Um, technology is part of it. Um, there's woodworking there, other materials. Uh, longer term, we're hoping to bring textiles perhaps to life, food technology to life as well. And we've got a really strong robotics program. It began several years ago with a, a teacher who brought it to life. And it's actually one of the ways in which we've really, uh, we've been successful integrating service. We've sponsored local Senegalese high schools in terms of, um, in terms of robotics and had them part of competitions as well. And so we're very exci excited about our design and technology program. Thanks, Lauren. Um, for the next question, I'm gonna put Miss Jen uh, on the spot. Uh, Miss Jen is our current middle school principal and MYP coordinator. Uh, next year, she'll be transitioning into being the um, assistant principal for all of the secondary school. And she's also one of our amazing theater teachers. And on top of that, she's a mom of four ISD students. Mm -hmm. Jen, the question is, from a parent perspective and a, um, an administrator perspective, what sort of extracurricular activities are offered? Ooh. Um, well, I can tell you as a mom that there truly is something for everybody. Um, I have four different, very different daughters. And um, one of the things that I love both working at the school and also as a parent is the variety and the choice that the kids have in the extracurricular activities. So we have um, a very robust sports program. Um, normally that's going on all year long. This year we actually have with COVID precautions been able to start an after school activities program again very recently for sports. We have theater after school. Somebody asked if there was a choir. Our music teacher, one of our music teachers at the school does have a secondary choir as an after school uh, program. There's also Model United Nations, um, robotics as Mr. Bird said. There really is something for everyone. Um, in the theater program, there's usually something for middle school, something for high school, musical, non-musical, smaller productions, student directed productions. We have a lot of different choice. Um, and we also have an amazing faculty that act as advisors for those programs and coaches for those programs so that kids can not only take part, but they can gain leadership skills and um, it can evolve into much bigger, bigger service projects um, as it has done in the past. Um, every single year, some student comes forward with a passion and talks to a faculty member and says, hey, could we develop this program? Absolutely. And so that's another um, part of our after school activities program that I truly, truly find phenomenal because it's not um, all school led. It is led by your passions as students. Thanks, Ms. Jen. Next question is what is the average tenure for teachers and their background of certifications? Um, we recruit internationally. Um, our, one of our goals is to have a faculty that uh, mirrors or reflects our student body. So we are recruiting from all continents. Uh, obviously our teachers are certified in there or, or a home of country. 80% of our teachers have a graduate degree. Um, and while it's not a requirement, most of our teachers that we hire are IB uh, experienced in either PYP, MYP, or DP. The average tenure at ISD tends to be about four years uh, for a teacher. Um, it's a little bit skewed downward because in life, sometimes people need to head home, uh, elderly parents or getting married or what have you. Uh, but right now our average tenure is about four years. Uh, it's about, which is around the worldwide average and longer uh, than the tenure here in Africa. Lauren, the next one's for you. For the IB program, does a student have to be at the high level of math to take math HL? Um, excuse me, have to be at a high level of math to take math HL? Also in math HL is required if the student's planning on pursuing an engineering field. Working, working backwards, we have a really strong college counseling program here. And the counselors begin working with the students as early as grade nine and 10, getting them gently ready for what's coming. And they bring parents into the process actively in grades 11 and 12 as well. And so if you're looking into a given program, be it engineering, be it medicine, if there is a program in a school that you're wanting, we'll work with you and we'll make sure that you know the requirements before you enter the diploma program. And so some engineers 
engineering schools, some engineering programs definitely demand high level math. And we'll know that, you'll know that well ahead of time so that there are no surprises. And in terms of placement in math, uh, beginning in grades nine and 10, we have what we call extended math in the MYP, which takes the content in the ninth and 10th grade math classes and extends it. It has students going above and beyond. And the students who go through nine extended and 10 extended, they typically have the option of moving into higher level math if they're wanting to. Uh, our teachers know our students well, and there's not a placement process, but there's definitely a placement consultation, if you will. And so we also reach out as a math department, working with the students and families. If there's a student for whom they need it, we'll let you know. And if there's a student for whom high level math is a really good fit, then we work with you as a family to also make sure that that, um, that happens. Because we believe every, every student should be challenged. And so if it's a good fit, we'll make sure that that, um, that happens. I'm actually going to answer this question as a parent. One of the things I hadn't said is I'm actually a parent of two ISD alumni who went on to uh, fairly uh, strong universities. Um, my daughter was a math HL student and, and her path was a little bit different. Um, she actually, when we came in, she was in grade nine um, and worked really hard to, to move down the path and, and at the advice of um, the math HL teacher, she actually took an additional course over the summer or a fresh course to make sure that she was able to do the course um, higher level. Um, my daughter's one who, who is good at math, but it's not sort of comes automatically, um, but she works really hard at it. So what I tell you as a parent to the students out there and the parents, math HL is, is not for the faint of heart. Um, if you're a good math student, you can certainly try it, providing you're willing to put in the time and effort. Uh, remember, any IB eight higher level course is equal to the uh, first year course at university. So if you're taking math HL, you're taking the first semester of calculus at university. Um, I can tell you the advantage of it is that if you're taking a higher level course and you score well enough on an exam, you actually get university credits for it. Um, my daughter has gone on to, uh, she's a math and comp sci major at New York University in New York, and she was set up very well through our IBHL program. So enough of the proud dad moment, but I'll speak on that. If you wanna know anything else about my kids, just let me, just ask. Uh, could you update the status of the new Performing Arts Center? I can. Um, as I said, we, it is open. Um, it, we had our first uh, performance from our thespian group um, for a group of grade 12 students, faculty, and their parents. Um, the, in addition to the Performing Arts Center, we have a black box theater um, and part of the athletic complex will be the a dance yoga studio. Uh, the lights and the sounds and the tech in the theater are, are really amazing to the point we have to hire a specialist to help teach us how to use it all. We're really excited about it. Um, we will be holding graduation in, in, the, um, in the theater as well. I'll go on to answer the other side of it, um, our athletic complex. Um, is, is coming into its last stages. We're putting down the court, probably starting next, this week or next week, uh, and the lines, and then we will install the bleachers and we'll be done. So we fully expect that to be ready for uh, opening the school in September. Um, it's a pretty special gym. It's a double gym. So you have two, you, uh, two gyms going horizontally and then vertically is one full-size gym that would allow all the bleachers to come out. And our gym will have a very unique feature. At one end of the gym, it's a glass wall. And when you're shooting free throws, you are overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so it's a pretty spectacular part of it. Uh, going onwards, I'll even go one step further. Um, we just started the, our pool project where it's the last part of our renovation. We're expanding our pool from four lanes to six lanes because uh, we do have a fairly robust swim team. Uh, and we're going to heat the pool, which will allow us to swim both in the fall and the spring. All right, keep going. Lauren, science subjects in high school, please. Yeah, science um, for grades 9 and 10, we have physics, chemistry, and biology. And we're really excited this year. We're bringing a fourth science to life in grades 11 and 12 for the diploma program, the environmental systems and societies. And so we have a, a fourth offering there. ESS actually can be either a group three, the humanities based course, or it can be counting as the science. And so we're very excited about that. Uh, our science program has made good strides over the past several years. We've revamped our, our science labs. And so they're much better equipped to engage students in practical work. And we're very, we're very happy about that. And our science results have improved significantly over the past 
three or four years. And so our science program is, is now strong and looking to continue that. A good number of our students do double sciences, and we're also proud of that as well. Thank you, Laura. Um, oh. Is there a choir? Um, yes, there is. We've obviously had to suspend it for COVID. But as we move past that, uh, Miss Sandy is our elementary music teacher, teacher is very eager to get it restarted. Uh, do we have a pool on campus? Yes, we do. Right now, it's kind of a hole in the ground because they're tearing it apart. But it will be a six lane pool with, uh, with they'll be heated and there'll be bleachers for our swim events. Uh, what kind of things will we learn in PE? Jen or Lauren, either one of you want to jump in? Uh, happy to pass on to Jen as NYP coordinator. I think she can, <laughs> she can speak well. We have the classic sports, if you will. And so when you pop in and you see students engaged in sports, it'll look kind of like what you'd see maybe when I was younger, when we were younger as adults. But it's a little bit different. And Jen can speak to the ways in which we, we bring concept, conceptual learning to life in PE as well. Um, so thanks for mentioning our age, Lauren. Um, yeah, PE was different when I was a kid. Um, it was just about getting out and playing whatever sport it was of the day, it was kickball or whatever. And you really were only um, learning that the rules of that game and how to play that sport for that sport's sake. MYP PE, it's actually PHE, it's physical health and education is much broader. It's much more conceptual. Yes, you are still learning to play sports. You might have a net games unit um, or an aquatics unit um, or a hitting and catching unit. And within that, you don't just learn um, rules of a game. You look at the bigger picture. Why are you playing? How are you playing? The not just the mechanics, but also um, those concepts that will translate and transfer to other parts of your physical and healthy lifestyle. And so that's one of the things that um, I think is most beneficial about the MYP um, physical education, because you can, you know, this, it, it works for those kids that are awesome at sports and love to play sports for sports sake, but it also gives other kids um, the chance and the opportunity to learn the appreciation and the rules and how to play and be physically fit and healthy, not just for that year, but for life. And so um, it's a much broader um, and more all encompassing way to teach PHE. And um, I wish I had, I wish I was going to school now <laughs> when it comes to PE for sure. Certainly the, I think what I want to emphasize, you know, the overall philosophy is, is fitness for life. Uh, we're fortunate we have a very well-equipped gym uh, on campus. By the way, parents, you can use it after school. Um, and, and it's really teaching the students how to keep themselves healthy, how to develop, develop their own self-care plan and that blending between health and wellness. Uh, Nick would like to know, is there, there is a school band, is it available to seventh grade and how to join? We do instrumental music. Uh, it, is, it is band instruments, both as part of the academic program and after school. Um, I'm actually sitting here looking at our new band teacher who, who's coming in, who's attending the session as a parent. Um, and, and he knows very clearly you know, that there'll be multiple actually different groupings for band. Uh, we'll probably see an upper elementary beginning. You'll see you know, an advanced uh, and so forth. So we want it to, to expose it out for uh, those who started uh, who are just beginning and those who, who have a skill to it. There's a question down below about violin. We don't do strings right now. Um, it's not part of, of our academic program. However, we have taken advanced or you know, intermediate to advanced string players and they have fit into the after school bands. Um, so we can continue to work on that. Is there a debate team? At the moment, no, but I'd love to have one. Um, this is a great example of what Jen was talking about is that a lot of our after school activities um, are often student interest. Um, one of the things that you see at our school, our belief is that we don't want to have students have to choose between sports and being in the play or being in the band and be, doing model United Nations and robotics. But having said that, there's only so many hours in a day. And so oftentimes it's a matter of having enough kids who are interested in it. Um, and then finding a faculty member for it. So we have many, many examples of how students got, a, got school programs started. And I personally do love, love debate. 
do you think that the COVID restrictions will continue next year? Um, man, I wish I had that crystal ball. Um, I will tell you that I do believe some COVID restrictions will continue next school year. Um, I do not believe that we'll reach the level of uh, vaccination amongst our community that we can totally dismiss all of them. Um, I can tell you that we have some natural advantages being here in Senegal. For example, we're what I call a tropical campus. There are no internal hallways. All the hallways open up into the outside. And in fact, I don't know if you're aware of this, but our, our campus is actually across the street from the Atlantic Ocean. So when you are on the third or fourth floor and you walk out your classroom, you have a 180 degree view of the Atlantic Ocean. But how that helps us is we can eat outdoors. So our students have all different areas where they can eat outdoors uh, as they're passing in it. So as a country, we've seen fewer uh, cases um, than other places around the world. Uh, vaccines, by the way, are available here, open to anybody of any nationality. You actually don't need an appointment. So we're optimistic that we can ease, continue to ease restrictions as we have. When we get back to the point fully living life like 2019, um, we'll really be up to how the virus progresses over the next six months. And I've certainly given up on trying to predict the future on that. Uh, but like I said, I can tell you, you'll be in school in person. You'll have a chance to do some sports and some activities. Um, and, and those aspects will definitely happen. Uh, sports teams are there. Sports teams, um, we, we have basketball, football, volleyball, softball, swim. Uh, in the past, we also have had a cross country team um, around that. Those are the set ones. In normal years, we compete against uh, other organizations here in Dakar, uh, other schools. The sports in Senegal are much like Europe, so there are club teams. So if we're playing volleyball or football, we're playing against club teams or community teams. Um, and then in, again, in normal times, probably not next year, but the year after, we do have international travel with other schools in West Africa. Uh, dance or gymnastics as an extracurricular activity. Uh, we, we have had dance and we have had gymnastics. I wouldn't say it's a robust uh, gymnastics program like many places in the States, uh, but we definitely have had, uh, our dance teams are, are pretty strong and powerful. Um, at one point, I think 30% of all students were part of the dance team, uh, and, and it, we have excellent coaches around that. Um, there's also, uh, in the past, we've had things like ballet or other types a, as an after-school activity. Uh, question here about some students who take different paths to the diploma program. Uh, what are the options? Um, the way, what I expressed was that we, in high school, we actually have options that give us a different pathway for students who choose not to do the diploma program. Um, Lauren, you want to talk about your three pathways to an, uh, to uh, ISD high school diploma? Yeah, we're, we're very excited. The, the board in the last meeting just approved what we're calling the, um, a third pathway. Students can go through and earn the full diploma. They take the six classes, they do CAS, TOK, and the extended essay. That's one pathway forward. Some students choose not to, to engage in the full IB diploma. They take the six diploma classes and they may opt out of TOK or the extended essay, for example, for a variety of reasons. They might choose to do more higher levels, for example. And so we have a, a second path there where students are in diploma program classes. And this year, what we've brought to life is a program, we call it the ISD Career Related Program, and it's modeled after the IB's program. Uh, down the road, we hope to bring that to life formally. And it offers students for whom um, the full diploma either isn't the right fit in terms of who they are as learners, or it might not be the right fit in terms of where the student wants to, to pursue further studies or pursue a career down the road. And we've had um, partnerships formed with um, the World Academy of Sport, which is run out of Australia, the Savannah College of Art and Design, which is run out of the US. And we're about ready to form a, a partnership as well with a, a group out of Switzerland in terms of hotel and management schools. And the students are required to take some classes and they have a, a limited number of classes in terms of the DP classes that we offer. And then they can complement the program by engaging in more um, career related or targeted classes. And so they might be wanting to study purposefully business or sports management or art more thoroughly. And part of this program is also a requirement for an internship. And then a project that is like the extended essay, but again, it's 
refine towards the, the skills, the possible profession that they're wanting to engage in. The program will still allow, the pathway will still access, allow access to post high school education. And so there still are options to get into colleges and universities, but it's a different route. And what we're trying to do is realize the differences we have in learners, the different aspirations that they want and the different um, abilities and, and um, I guess kind of affinities that they have. And so it allows us to differentiate better so that students can find something that will serve them well, but still of a, a rigorous standard. Thank you, Lauren. Soccer, how is it organized? Uh, in normal times, and we hope to get there next year, is we have what's called a no-cut policy in our secondary school sports. That means that if we have enough students who want to play, uh, we'll find some coaches and hopefully some games. Um, so, for example, at, we have a middle school boys soccer program, a middle school girls soccer program, uh, and we may have an A team, a B team, or a C team. The teams typically are roughly divided by ability um, as we're competing and the different teams have different opportunities to compete uh, around that. Um, so it's, it's quite, quite robust. We have both in-house coaches from our faculty as well as coaches from the community. Uh, soccer is a, obviously a major sport here in Senegal and we get a lot of top-notch coaches. Ms. Jen, would you like to take the one? Do you have any talent shows? Uh, this kind of goes back to what I was saying before. We have had talent shows. We have had fashion shows. We've had lots of different um, shows that spring from what students want. Um, and I'm going to say, I think we had elementary usually always has a talent show every year. Um, they actually had one this year virtually. They did it really creatively. And secondary school normally does have some sort of talent show every single year, some type type of showcase. Again, students have an idea, faculty will help them, and they put that together. Um, and the other thing I was going to piggyback on what um, Alan said about the sports program. As a parent, I can tell you, my kids um, at our previous school, we've been here four years, and at our previous school, um, our daughters would, you know, it was the traditional, you try out, you have a week, if you don't make that team, you're cut, and then you don't get coached. Um, and so here with that no cut policy in the secondary, um, all of my daughters have become so much uh, better at sports, but also they, they love it. They wanna pursue it. It has actually um, changed my eldest daughter who's about to go to college she's majoring in kinesiology because she has loved what she's learned about herself as you know not the best athlete in the world but somebody who loves that lifelong health and wants to help others discover that and so um, it's one of the things that you know the plays are the same way the talent shows are the same way we want kids to participate and learn something new about themselves in that process thanks jen next question is how many students are in a class um, I would say for next year in grades six through 10, you can probably plan on having 18 to 20 students in a class. Uh, at the IB diploma level, grade 11 and 12, our goal is not to get above 15, and you'll probably actually see some classes between 10 and 12 students. Uh, do we have rugby? We don't have rugby as a sport. There is rugby available in the community. Um, but once again, I, I think, you know, we, um, we're always happy to start something as an after school activity. Um, one of the things when we're looking at sports is who do we get to play against? And none of the other schools or the clubs play rugby here. Uh, are families allowed to use sports facilities outside school hours? Most definitely. Um, we're, I think it's one of the best parts about our school is our school's really a community center more than anything else. Um, so families are allowed to uh, use the facilities. Obviously the priority goes to the students and the student activities. Um, and so obviously our courts and our gyms and our pools are, are quite busy after school. Um, but you, parents are allowed to come in uh, after four o'clock between four and six and use whatever facilities aren't being used uh, by the kids. And the campus is open 10 to six on the weekends. Uh, it's, it's not uncommon to have uh, folks in the fitness room, you know, might have a couple of kids. Uh, Lauren and I both work out when, uh, a fair bit. You might have a parent, you might have somebody from the finance office. So it's very much of a community center that way. And of course, the pool is open on weekends. Uh, will the swil swim team participate in competitions? Uh, and when do they train? The swim team is so large, it's actually from grades three to 12. Uh, 
It's so large, they have multiple practice opportunities, both mornings and afternoons. By mornings, I mean before school. Uh, but we have a lot of people who love to come in and do that because uh, it allows them to be part of the swim team and then an after school sports team. Um, and my hope is we'll, we will have competitions. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, it may not be a, a, um, a travel one uh, for next year, but we're certainly, um, our kids participated in a virtual meet uh, in terms of matching times. School lunches be available. Um, we haven't really talked about our canteen. Uh, we do have an outside vendor named Ensemble who provides uh, lunches. The students can order in advance or in the morning. Um, and there's an option of hot lunches as well as some a la carte sandwiches and those types of things. Uh, will sports classes such as swimming be obligated? Swimming is part of our PE curriculum. Our students uh, all the way up through grade 10 uh, at some point do take swimming as, as part of that. So that is a, a yes. Are there COVID restrictions for wind and brass instruments? Up until now, uh, yes, because we haven't had it. Um, we're looking at restarting it uh, with understanding the science behind it. Um, one of the things that we, as we continue to learn about it, we'll continue to look at how we can expand it out. Uh, let's see, do you have drills for fires, break-ins, tornadoes? Um, we don't have tornadoes, thank goodness, here. Uh, we are the birthplace of hurricanes in the United States. Uh, we most definitely have what we would call evacuation drills. Uh, and what we also have is what's called safe haven drills. Um, safe haven drills, we have two different levels. One would be in case there was an event in the city where we would secure and lock down our campus and students would be in the classroom. And then we do um, also have our, our kids practice uh, safe haven drills with uh, intruder on campus. I'm gonna take this opportunity to talk to you a little bit about our security of our campus. Uh, we obviously, while we've moved away from being an American school with an American curriculum, we do maintain a continued relationship with the U.S. Embassy. One of the ways they continue to support us is in security, uh, both advice, personnel, and uh, security grants. Uh, so our school has a, you know, is a full wall. We have our own guard contingent. Uh, in addition to our own guards, we have three Senegalese police officers, gendarmes, who support us in our outside our campus walls. Um, we also have three of our own security people who uh, are experienced in close protection. And I'll tell you a really great story. Um, one day we were being visited by the US ambassador uh, and he pulled onto campus and his bodyguard came out of the car uh, and looked towards our security director and, and went up and was really excited to see him because our security director trained the Senegalese bodyguard for the US ambassador. And the U.S. ambassador said to me, why do you have the teacher and I have the student? And I said, Mr. Ambassador, it's all about the children. So um, we are, go off on that segue, but we do, we have a fair, very secure campus. We monitor it regularly. We check it. We have security audits. We maintain um, conversation, uh, connections with the U.N. security folks, as well as Canadian embassy, French embassy, British embassy. Uh, I also am a co-chair of the Overseas Security Advisory Council for Dakar. Um, it's a collection of uh, four uh, non-government agencies, schools, charities, uh, businesses, and what have you. Um, and we, we share communication. Uh, during the recent unrest back in March, uh, the OSAC group was very important in terms of me all to share information. So we take security very seriously. We're fortunately Senegal is a relatively safe and stable country. Um, the unrest that did happen in March was so shocking for so many of us. Um, but it, just so you know, we, security is always a high priority. Do we have badminton? We do. It is a uh, it is part of our PE curriculum around that. And I think we've actually had an ASA once in a while. I'm going to stop talking and pass it off to either Miss Jen or uh, Mr. Bird. Do we have Spanish? Yeah, we have a, a growing Spanish program. We brought it to life two years ago, and we're complementing French. We're trying to grow into that. And the next question, we're also trying to promote the, the students engaging in their mother tongue. In the diploma program, we have self-taught languages that are recognized through the DP, and so we find ways to bring that to life as well. And we're trying to do more of that also in grades 9 and 10 as well. So for students who are wanting to study their, their native language, their mother tongue, we're trying to find ways to bring that to life as well, either in class, um, 
where we can arrange tutors or help families arrange uh, tutors for that, but also outside uh, as after school activities. There's some local language institutes in the city, more are, are growing, and so we're trying to also connect families to that as well. And as we grow, we're looking to bring um, more Wolof to life as well, so that we can support the acquisition of our, our host culture as well. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, quick question, can the students use the pool after school hours? Yes, generally not after school. I mean, it depends outside of the sports season, yes, but a lot of the kids will use it on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, Jen, let me give you this one. Outside of specific classes and after school activities, what are the opportunities for students to interact with each other? Do all students eat together? Are there breaks? This was one of the things that struck me when we moved here. Um, as Alan was saying, our campus is very open. Um, it's a very fluid campus and things are a little different right now with COVID restrictions because right now kids are staying within their um, cohort of 20 kids while they eat lunch um, and on their breaks, but then they're able to play sports with masks on um, within their grade level. Normally, uh, outside of COVID times, it is very different than that. You'll see people of all different grade levels um, eating, uh, playing, talking, chatting. We do have a break in the day in the morning in between the two morning classes. You also have advisory every single day in the MYP years um, or a study hall. And then you also have a lunch break. And after school, it's usually a very teeming place um, where everyone is there. And it's a very social school, which is one of the things that I really loved about it. It wasn't, it's not like sixth graders don't talk to seventh graders, don't talk to eighth graders. It's not like that at all. Um, that's been probably one of the hardest things I would say about COVID is the fact that kids have to be a little more restricted in who they can be with on campus because of contact tracing and keeping kids safe um, in, their, in their cohorts. Thanks, Jen. Uh, either Jen or Lauren, next question is, how does student council work? Yeah, we've made a bit of a change uh, last year and this year. Uh, we used to have a more traditional like, student council in the middle school and the high school where students ran for positions of president, vice president, secretary, and treasurer. And beginning last year, we opened it up and we made it a, a collaborative endeavor. If any student is wanting to get involved in making the school a better place through active leadership, we didn't want to turn anybody away and we wanted all the students there involved equally. And so we have um, uh, what we call now is the High School Student Leadership Council and the Middle School Leadership Council. And they're coming together, they're meeting once, sometimes twice a week, and they're looking into ways to make the school better for students. And that could be academically, that could be in terms of sports and activities, it could be in terms of positive environment or in terms of fun events. And so they're coming together to do a variety of different things. With Ramadan happening right now, the Leadership Council has put together a food drive. And that's one example of what they've managed to do during um, COVID times. And historically, they've done things like bring to life social events for, for fun dances, for example, through the year. And they've also been taking the charge in revamping our, our dress code. And so they're actually actively involved in terms of creating the, um, the policy, the expectations within our school. And so we're looking to find ways to continue to grow that. And we're looking at finding ways to bring in um, groups to complement that in terms of improving diversity, equity, and inclusion in our school as well. Uh, student voice is integral. Uh, we need to make sure that students find their voice and are finding ways to, to become the best leaders they can, which means we have to actively give them responsibility. And we're, we're making progress in that, in that regard. Thank you. Uh, will there be field trips? Uh, obviously they were suspended this year. In normal times, we have field trips both within Dakar, either for service projects, uh, often do some things around the French language or the arts. Um, and then we have, again, in traditional times, uh, our week without walls, where the students travel grades six through 11, will travel throughout Senegal. Um, and obviously it didn't happen this year, but we're, we're certainly keeping our mind open for next year. Um, in terms of being able to get the students back out there to experience Senegal. All of our Week Without Walls trips have a dual purpose of service and connecting to Senegalese students. Is there an, is the LGBTQ plus community supported in ISD? Most definitely. We have a Gay Straight Alliance, which is for LGBTQ plus uh, students as well as allies. 
Uh, we have faculty sponsors around that. And the purpose of the group is to provide support uh, and advocacy and communication. One of the things Lauren alluded to is we're starting up a social justice council. Uh, one of the aspects that we've been working really hard on this year is diversity and inclusion. Uh, at ISD, that means it, it, the board has established a goal of being uh, all students, all members, excuse me, all members of our community will be heard, respected, and valued. Uh, and that is truly all, whether it's ethnicity, uh, sexuality, gender, what have you. Um, and so we also see that um, extending out again into our social justice council, which is starting up this spring, where, stu where we're going to involve students not only in advocacy and providing information um, or, or input into uh, decisions Lauren and I make or our leadership makes, but also in terms of educating parents and staff. Uh, will there be assemblies, Ms. Jen? Yeah, we um, have continued to have assemblies or community time, as we call them, throughout the times of COVID. They've just been virtual. And so every other week for high school, every three weeks for middle school, we have community time where we might highlight if we have a leadership spotlight for somebody in the world that our kids bring forward that um, they want to highlight that and help teach the community about. They might have fun house games. The middle school has house groups, which is something we get together for um, every three weeks. And then we also have um, service. And so we get together as a larger group. And then we also have our advisory groups. And so we have lots of mini communities within that larger community. Before COVID and after COVID, we will be getting together again as an entire secondary. Uh, we try to do that every, a few times a year. Um, but as I said, we have still done that. It's just been virtual during the times of COVID. And we are all very anxious to get back to um, those times in person. We've run out of questions in the chat. Oh, one just came up. Um... Uh, with so many extracurriculars happening in the school, how can a parent get involved in these activities? Um, number one, we're always looking for coaches and sponsors. Uh, when you have a no-cut policy, you need a lot of different things. Um, so if you're a parent, when you arrive, if you're a parent with a skill set and want to be a part of those things, do let anyone, you can let Susan know, myself know, uh, Lauren, Jen, any of the team. Um, Colin Crumpton is our activities and athletics director, and he's always looking for help and support. Um, around that, so very much so. And some of the positions are paid and some of them are volunteer. Um, parents are very much a part of our school. They're partners with us. Um, and so we, we'd love to see that. We've had parents come in and say, hey, I'm really great at ballet. I'm really great at this. I'm really great at that. Um, and, and they've been a big part of our program. Do any of the students or anyone wanna ask their questions verbally? You can just raise your virtual hand or just kind of wave at me until I notice you. Uh, well, in case any other buddy, anyone else is typing in their questions. So I have to ask, we, we have the group here under the handle Pamina. Um, do you want to tell us, where are you driving? I'm fascinated. You're driving and you're listening to us. We, we love it. Oh, now they're frozen. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't get. Okay, I. I, I We're driving to Okay, you love that. So, if I heard you correctly, you're you're driving to Salzburg, Salzburg, as one does in the international school world. Other questions, comments? Oh, uh, I, I have one. So feel free to unmute yourself. Is it Ria, Raya, uh, under that handle? Unmute yourself and ask us the question. Um, I'm Ria. Ria. And I wanted to ask, is design and tech available as a subject for the IBDT? Ooh, great questions. Lauren, you want to take that one? For next academic year, it's not offered in the DP. And what we've done is we've had some preliminary uh, explorations in terms of bringing it to life. And so 
as we grow and bring the NYP to life and students progress through down the road, our, our hope is to bring uh, the design into the diploma program. And the, the earliest it could be the academic year after next but we need to look into that in terms of scheduling in terms of resources and most importantly in terms of student interest and so as the program grows the hope is that that's something that we can bring to life because of the the importance of that subject yeah i can tell if you i can tell you ria if you're interested is to push it and see what happens our ib film program started because of the students wanted to take it and and they did the legwork uh in grade nine and ten to get it done um uh, environmental science came back partially for that way. So, uh, you know, nothing is sort of fixed here. Students do have a big say. And if you can uh, push Mr. Bird and show him the student numbers that there's enough students who want it, then then we'll try to do it. We have some really exciting design folks uh, who I think would be a, it'd be a cool program. All right, let's see. How much time do we have for break and lunch? Lauren and Jen, you want to talk about that one? In the, in the morning, we have a 15 minute break and students have um, a chance to, to have a break between the two classes in the morning. And then we've done well, we've had a little bit of an extended lunch. Uh, we extended the lunch last year and it's carried through to this year as well. And students have, I think it's 50 minutes. It allows students time to eat. We're asking that students do eat well and take the time to eat and eat well, eat healthily. And then it gives them time to be outside and, and to play and to be active. And one of the things that we love to see is all the way through grade 12, we have uh, probably half of our kids are outside every day playing either basketball, volleyball, football, and they are active. And it's really important for us to, to get out there and, and spend that time. And so we have a little bit of a longer lunch. The other thing that it affords is a chance. Oh, Lauren froze. I'm not sure. It, it sounded like a great answer though, that there was something else there. So we'll pause and wait for him to come back. Uh, I see a hand raised for the, uh, somebody logged on as Matthew Green, but I don't think Matthew wants to answer. I think, I think Miss Green wants yeah, to ask it. Um, I was just wondering what, like, you have to speak up, I was wondering what eighth graders were learning, like, what are the subjects we're supposed to learn? Miss Jen, do you want to take this one? Everybody in the MYP, we have, remember that wheel that Mr. Bird showed at the beginning that had the courses around the outside. So those eight classes are the same eight classes for every year in the MYP. And so you have language and literature and um, you have design for a semester and you have wellness for the other semester. You have an arts course and in eighth grade, you have one semester of either music or theater or visual art. And then the other semester you switch um, I didn't go in order, Lauren, so now I know I'm going to forget. I didn't go one to six. Uh, you have math, you have science, you have individuals in society, which is kind of like um, um, social studies, and you have PHE, like which is physical education, and language. So you have um, either French or Spanish at this point. Um, is the, the language acquisition offerings that we had this year. And so as Mr. Bird spoke, we'll be seeing how we can um, fill those out and have more options for MYP students in the future. And then you do units of study in all those classes. And sometimes you have units that combine two different courses and you're learning the same thing in INS as you're learning in science. And it's really cool. Um, the other day I walked into one class and the kids were dissecting some part of a goat in science. I'm not exactly sure what part, but um, it didn't smell the best, but the kids were super happy. So I was, I, I left pretty soon after that because I, I had a little weak stomach, but it was great. And they seemed very happy. So yeah, we learned lots of fun stuff in those eight subjects throughout the year. There you go. Other questions? While you're still thinking, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about coming in as new students uh, in the orientation programs and those types of things. Uh, first of all, I would tell you, um, if you are interested in coming to our school and you haven't completed the application process, please do so as soon as possible. 
Um, our school does, we uh, have a great demand for our seats. Um, and, and this year we had a number of grades that did reach capacity. So uh, if, you're, if you're considering applying or having completed it, please do follow through that process. Um, we school-wide, we generally have between 180 and 200 students a year, new students a year. Um, we bring in most of those students in Jan, I'm sorry, in, in August and September. Um, we have an orientation program for it. One of the things that is great about our school is that how welcoming the current students are to the new students, because everybody was in that position. Um, and so, you know, the counselors and the team will buddy you up with students. They'll make sure that you have somebody to show you how it works. Um, and you'll have an opportunity to meet, meet the students and settle in. Uh, if some of you are not going to be able to be here for the start of school in August, some of you, you may not be able to get your travel orders or, or fly in until after that, don't worry. Um, the, we just picked up a family last week um, with an elementary and a middle school girl. And both girls have been instantly adopted by the other kids in the class. They have plenty of people to show them around. We're fairly used to it. Um, and, and our kids love meeting the new kids and, and exploring that way. Um, so we do transition that in fairly well. As I filled that time, and we've been on the, on the call for about 75 minutes, um, give the opportunity to just wait a bit for any last questions around it. Well, um, Obviously, if you, if you hang up and all of a sudden you get a slew of questions, you know Ms. Kusima, Susan is your point of contact. She can direct you the questions depending upon what they are to Lauren and the, well, the secondary counselors or myself. Um, this is a really cool school. Um, as I said, I'm an ISD parent of alumni. I've uh, been working here seven years. Uh, as you can see, you know, Lauren has a high school daughter. Jen has daughters all across the school. Um, we wouldn't be here as an educator if it wasn't a great place for our children. Um, so we look forward to welcoming you all when the time comes uh, within that. Please do stay safe. Uh, to our new families, we anticipate, uh, I will be communicating with all of our new and prospective families probably starting in June and then in July around COVID and what school looks like. Um, and then we'll be moving on. And once we get into August, we'll, we'll do weekly conversations. Uh, this year, I did town halls where we invited any and all parents to come and listen to our, our opening plans. Uh, and I'll anticipate doing that again in August. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming out. For the family who's driving, stay safe as you're driving. Uh, and we look forward to seeing all of you in person soon. Bye now.